I want us to look here in Galatians 2 as we continue with this thought the exchanged life. Galatians 2 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Can somebody say amen? amen? It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. Who loved me, gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died in vain. I want to say to you, and we'll get to Ephesians 2 in just a little bit. But as you look to God's word in life class and trying to earn the, or, or trying to merit God's favor in our life, it's like our children bringing us monopoly money wanting to pay the rent. Doesn't work. Any work or effort on our part to obtain righteousness and holiness of God without the blood, without the sacrifice, and without the Spirit of God, we fall woefully short of the goodness of the Lord. But we see here that God has given us something. He's given us Christ Jesus himself as he came and he lived and he died. He rose again the third day and then he was seated at the right hand of the Father. Now we've talked about and we see how that the blood deals with our sins, plural, S-I-N-S, plural. The sins that I have committed in my life have been dealt with by the blood of Jesus. God has forgiven me. He has forgiven me. He has forgiven you if you've accepted his sacrifice, his blood sacrifice as being enough. But how many know the Lord didn't leave us there, but he gave us even a, a, a greater, greater power in that he not only forgave us of our sins, help us to overcome our sin and Satan, but he also gave us a new nature, a new nature. And the cross deals with my old nature. Because how many know when you enter in to life with Jesus Christ, you have a new commander in chief, the Spirit of God. But it doesn't eradicate the, the old man. He's still there. Given opportunity, he will overcome and overpower. In fact, if you give sin, that sin nature, the opportunity, it will destroy how many of you seen come into the body of Christ and not walk in the fullness of God? And next thing you know, it's they're going back. And how many of us have been in that place? You go back and you start lingering in the old places that you came out of. You start entertaining the old thoughts that you had put under the under the blood. You you go back to those places, and next thing you know, the sin that you thought you were over is now reaping havoc in your life because it's very much alive. But see the beautiful thing is is God has given us the power to overcome the sin nature by giving us a new nature and he has given us the power to overcome self as we have talked about but here we have been studying the exchange life being a life that comes from being in Christ we talked about last week and the week before how that we are in Christ we have been buried in Christ in him we have been buried. We have died to self so that we can arise in Christ. But if we have been buried in him, and the example we gave was this. Our families have gone through wars. Your ancestors have gone through wars. They have gone through plagues. They have gone through famine. But how many know that without, uh, if they would have died, you would have died with them. If all of my misdealings and the car wrecks that I was in and the infections that attacked my body when I was a child, if I would have died then, then my children would have died with me and my grandchildren would have died with me. So you say, how do we die in Christ? 
Because when he died, if we accept his sacrifice, we have all died in him. But if we have all died in him, then we are also risen with him. Now we have a new nature in Christ. But the point I want to get to today, the point I want to get to today is found in Ephesians, the second chapter. I want to begin reading here in the fourth verse. But God, who is rich in mercy, in fact, he is more than a multimillionaire, billionaire, trillionaire. He is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised up, notice there, we've died in him, that were raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the age to come, we might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, not of works, least any man should boast. There's no boasting that we can take for our salvation. It is only by the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we can merit salvation. But I want you to notice something there. Do you agree with me that the word of God is infallible? It's mutable. It is perfect. It is absolute. The word of God is true. Would you agree that God's word is true? In the word, he says that we have been buried with him. Do you believe that? Do you fully comprehend that? Uh, trying to. <laughs> trying to trying to grapple with these thought, this thought process. Do you believe that you have risen with Christ if you've been buried with Christ? That power that worked in Jesus Christ to raise him from the dead, guess where it's resident now? It's in the heart of the believer. It's in the heart of the church. So when you get to that place and you're, you're thinking, man, I can't do this, uh, guess what? You can't. But the one who raised Jesus from the dead can, and he is right there with you. And so now you die to self and so that you can live to Christ. That the power of the resurrection of Christ, the reason I don't walk in the sins that I used to walk in or the nature that I used to walk in is not because I am able. It's because I trust in the one who has enabled me not to do those things. So I can't boast about it. I can't boast about anything that is accomplished. All things that are good came from the good God who gave his good gift to me and to you. And so there's no boasting. So if I have been buried in Christ and I have been risen in Christ, I must also accept that I am now seated in Christ. How is that even possible? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And yes, and so are we. And so are we. Now, as we look at that, let me prove this, this point further with more scripture. Hebrews 10, verses 12 through 13. But when Christ had offered for all time, for all time, All past, all present, all future. The beginning to the infinite future that is before all time. When time began until time ends. One sacrifice. Only one was needed. Think about it. For sins. He set down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made his footstool. Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, who the author 
the one that wrote our faith, and also the one who finishes our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Mm. Where's Jesus? Setting down. Romans 8, or Hebrews 8 and 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty. He is seated. He is seated. God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And he rested upon the seventh. Mm. Did he rest because he was tired? Did he rest because, man, you are so much work? Did he get so exhausted in all of his imagination? He just sat upon his throne and he spoke and the worlds came into existence. The sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, plant life, water, habitation. He did all of that in six days. Oh, Gabriel, Michael, I'm going to take a nap. I'm worn to a nub. No, he never even went to sleep. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He is never weary. No, you not. But the God that we serve, he never tires. He never is weary. He is never weak. So why is he sitting? You don't sit down when the work to be done. You sit down when the work is finished. If I ever find anybody sitting while the work needs to be done, I think, get up. <laughs> used to have a little business I had on the side, and they called me the warden. Because it, it was a job, an insulation. You had to blow insulation in the walls and scrape it down. You had to grab the buckets. You had to throw it back in the machine. You had to just do this, and it was a whole process. You had to keep moving. I'd go get guys here and there and go out and help me. And they call me the warden because you had to be moving, 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 moving. Nobody sat down. You got to be up and moving. Now, I was the one carrying the, 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 the big trash cans and dumping it back in there. All I need you to do is scrape the wall, scoop it up, put it in a can. I'll take it back to the machine. We'll throw it back in the machine and we'll start it all over. I had one young man who was not accustomed to the work. In fact, he fell down. <laughs> I'd bring the bucket to him and instead of grabbing the bucket and put it back in the machine, he just fell down. It's like... We had to stop till he had to recover. You know, here's the thing. When there's work to be done, you got to be up working. It's a good principle, don't you think? If you want to get a job, keep a job, be working whenever it's time to work. Amen? Go rest when it's rest time. But if it's time to work, be working. But when you're finished working, then you sit down. Jesus Christ finished the work. And thus he sat down by the right hand of the Father, the power of the Father. He did no longer work because he was now sitting. He's resting, not because he's tired. It's because the work has been complete. If we could grab hold of this concept and understand that we have died in Christ, we have also risen in Christ, and now we can settle our hearts because the work is finished and we are seated in Christ. We're seated in Him. Thus we rest in Him. Now, I love the Word of God. And there are times where I get into passages of Scripture that we have been reading, and I think, man, I, I've drawn everything I can draw out of that, only to find out it is a well of living water that just keeps flowing. Now, I have preached this. I have professed this. I have taught my family this. I have taught the church this. But how many know that God can bring a brand new revelation to you? Before I get to that revelation, let me say to you today, something I picked up, a little nugget, years and years ago. I think Mike Clarence was the one teaching this class 25 years ago. 
maybe longer. He said, children, as we were talking about youth, he said, children need three things. Three things in order for healthy development. And I've come to find out that it's not just children, but children of God, children of this world. We need three basic elements in order to grow and to prosper and to live how we should live. He said, they need love, acceptance, and security. If you look up, you can see the psychological breakdowns and you can see the, uh, the developments of things as you look at studies on the, online and different things and you'll see the little pyramid and all that. And, but on the baseline of that, there, every person has to have their physical needs met. We, we've got we've to eat. We need shelter. We need those things. Those are our physical basic elements. We've got to drink water. But you you, you got to survive on more than Kool-Aid. you got to have some water. you got to have some... You gotta nourish yourself. You gotta eat. Depends on what we eat. It depends on how healthy we are. But we've got to have the we all have to have the basic elements, right? But beyond that, we've got to have love, we've got to have acceptance, and we've got to have security. When the enemy entered the garden, he tempted Eve and then beguiled her and Adam, and then they partook of sin. Nobody was after, he was after to thwart and distort the love, the acceptance, and the security that they had in God. If you do not feel security, then what do you feel? Insecure. You feel timidity. You're intimidated. If you don't feel secure, then fear begins to grip your heart. Some of you walked in here today and you have been, that's where you're living. You don't feel security because of the things going on around you. It's been disrupted. Your normal routines and the things that you were able to control and the the comfort level you had and the environment and the world you live, but now everything is in chaos. Thus your security has been torn down and now you start to feel insecure in your heart. And then we see acceptance. The enemy was after our acceptance and still today, it grieves my heart to say there's so many in the body of Christ and it's, it's not that there's not potential. It's not that there's not a uh, great destiny resting inside of them, but because of a breakdown in maybe the family structure, maybe a breakdown in relationships or failures or, or, or a rejection in their lives, somewhere along the way they have lost that sense of acceptance and now they're cloaked in shame because the pain is still real, it still exists. And now instead of feeling that acceptance that they have, they write from God. I feel that rejection feel the place and then all of a sudden we lose love if I don't feel love what do I what do I feel I feel hatred dislike oh preacher I don't feel hated by people but you feel you're a burden you're burdensome you're you're at a place and you you feel like that you're you're not wanted what is that an absence of? It's an absence of love. You're not feeling the love. And then you don't feel accepted. Then you don't feel secure. But the Lord showed me something in this passage, and this is what I have taught. This is what I have professed. This is what I tell my children. This is what I tell the church. But until it gets deep down in your, your, your nowhere, doesn't change you. Huh. Amen? Paul says this, and this is where we find our rest. That we're not trying to curry favor anymore. We're not trying to work out our, our shortcomings. We're not trying to feel accepted. We're not trying to feel secure. We're, we're just resting in Christ. What is it, preacher? Spit it out. Okay, you asked for it. The life which I now live in the flesh, God loves me. 
God loves me. God loves me. God loves me. Think about it. God so loved the world. Yes, yes, he does. He so loves everyone on the face of the earth. But folks, he loves me. And when I say he loves me, I'm saying to you, he loves you. Well, how can you love this? I don't know, but he does. You know how much this has messed up? Yeah, but he still loves me. He loves me more than I love my family, my wife, my grandchildren. That's a lot of love. Love. Yesterday, Nora was at the house. She's my, my, my middle grandchild. and She's two going on 22. I don't know. She's so smart and she's so honorary. She is a ring-tailed tutor. I'm telling you what, she, she was in there and they heard me screaming from the kitchen and because I was in the living room with her and she's got the table. I'm just catching the lamp as the plant is falling off in the, in the floor and dirt is going all over Nani's new carpet. It's everywhere. Numerous, numerous corrective spankings when she was little. He's paying for it twice over. <laughs> Little Miss Violet slammed her hand in a drawer of the coffee table. Now, she's the 10-month-old. I looked at that, and I was waiting on the scream. I couldn't get to her in time. And she looked at her finger, and she went, <clears throat> and then went back playing. I thought, oh, Hannah, you're in so much trouble. You're in so much trouble. But with my grandbabies and my children and my wife, I would give gladly my life. Why? Because I love them. And no matter what they do, where they go, how they perform, how they don't perform, why? Because I love them. But my love for them is not even comparable. My first child, Lainey, who leads her worship here, in case you didn't know, this beautiful child looks like her mother. She is my eldest. When she was born, my first thoughts when I looked at Lainey, when I seen her for the very first time, I said, oh my God, I did not know love like this existed. I, I didn't know that love existed, that I would do anything for that child. And then we had Hannah and Jacob, and now we have grandbabies, and it's the same love that doesn't diminish, but it continues to grow. But the moment I felt that for her, God spoke to my heart. And he said, son, that's not even comparable to the love that I have for you. It's not even comparable. But how often is it we get so busy we forget? We forget the hustle and bustle, the, uh, the routines of life, the, the chaos trying to keep up with everything. That we get to the place and we, we like, yes, we, we're buried in Christ. And, oh, I'm an overcoming through the blood of Jesus. And I'm going to walk this walk. But we forget to rest in the love of God. If you don't hear anything else, I want you to write this down somewhere. And I want you to repeat that throughout this week. And in your prayer times, before you ever go to God to make a petition or a praise, I want you to say this. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Doesn't that take care of my security issues? Doesn't that take care of my acceptance issues? Doesn't that take care of my self-hatred issues? How do you know Jesus loves you? I know he loves me because he told me. And then he went as far to show me. Hear me. 
When Paul is writing this, he's not writing it as a narcissist. He's not writing this as some egomaniac. He's saying to you that the love that that Christ has for me, he gave himself for me. He gave himself personally for me. This walk with Christ is personal. If nobody in this place decides that they're going to follow God and that the world is too big and there's too much out there to gain outside of Christ and the whole church walks away from the Lord, it doesn't mean that you have to. If you know the love of Jesus, you will stick with him. And when you get the love of Jesus in your heart, guess what? It's the end of the law. Another revelation I came to, when you get love involved, you don't need laws. My wife worked tirelessly yesterday serving her family. Why did she do that? She did that because she loves, as she said at life class this morning, she, how'd you say it, furiously, no, ferociously, thank you, somebody else was listening besides me, ferociously loves her children. Let me tell you, God ferociously loves you. How do I know? Because he told you, and then he went this far to show you. God in heaven. Paul is saying when those nails went through his hands, when they drove them through his feet, when he could have spoken and caused the recreation of all the universe in one breath of his nostril, one utterance of the syllable from his vocal cords, he could have altered the entirety of every person in this room, generation past, present, and future, but instead he endured the shame that was due me he endured that so that we may understand that we serve a God whose motivation is his love my faith is in him and my faith is in his love for me because when he died he died for me When I say he died for me, understand that what I'm saying to you is you got to make it personal. That if there was not one other soul, see, that's the risk that he took. That even though he gave everything, he still left man with choice. He still left you and I with the choice to receive by faith that he loves me. Let me say to you today, and this is one of those horse pills, self-hatred that clothes your inner man. This self-hatred that is it, it, it defines you. It says, we think that insecurity is the new measure of, of humility. No, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. It's understanding that God himself is your all in all, your everything. He is your God, and he loves you. And when he was nailed on the cross, he was nailed for you personally. He took all of my sins past. He took all of my sins present. He took all of my sins future, and he nailed them to the cross. He did that for me. He did that for you. Why did he do that? He did that because he loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves me. Now, if he loved me that much, I come to realize he accepts me. And he brings, I take security in his finished work. When you get to the end of the law, you have stepped over into love. There's only one motivation that would cause the righteous Jesus to come. 
and to endure all that he had, he had the power to change it off and to change everything and to alter. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Ah, oh, doesn't that just feel good? me. Stand, if you will. Oh, Father. There's been some lying propaganda that's come from hell. He was hell born, hell spawned, to bring about a destruction in the lives of children of God and in the world. That is, that the things that happen to you, it's because God doesn't love you. I've heard those voices. If you was better, if you was a better pre preacher, more people would listen to you. If you'd better look and people would be more people looking at you. If you was just better at leading and communicating and organizing and then you know you could you could do a whole lot more but you're you're kind of useless well my I wouldn't have got that flat my, on my tire and I would I wouldn't have chipped that windshield and I wouldn't have had that fender bender and I wouldn't have done this and done that if God loved me if God loved me I'd never be sick I'd never have a day's trouble I'd never have you know these things wouldn't be happening if God loved me How many know that's not God? But where does love work? Love works in an area that says you don't need the law when you're in love. I don't need a law to tell me to take care of my wife and my children, my grandchildren. Why? Because I love them. I don't show up and with a list of rules and say, okay, to prove you love me, you got to you got to finish this stuff right here. <laughs> honeydew. <laughs> you know why the honeydews have a honeydew? Because they ain't stuff done. <laughs> They're going to love you any less. Let's don't go there. Okay, I got a whole, I got a whole long list of stuff that I got to get done. But let me ask you. How much different would your life be if you truly believed, truly, truly believed that God loves you? Father, we come before you today. We live in a world filled with hurt and pain and shame. We try so many ways to find acceptance. Wrong relationships, wrong motivations. We try to find, Lord God, security in things that just never make us feel secure. The favor and applause of people. And Lord, we feel an overwhelming sense many times of being a burden and unwanted by others' responses. And Lord, it doesn't change your love for us. Lord, I ask today that there would be a revelation let it begin in the heart of the church and let it ripple out into the, those around us that you love us individually. And when we understand that you love us, it changes everything about us. We're not living in fear anymore because we're loved. We're not, feeling, we're not living in rejection anymore because we're loved. We're not a burden, Lord God, to anyone because we're loved. Lord, you so loved us that you gave your son to die for us. That if we would believe, we would have eternal life.